Good morning, everybody, and welcome uh, to our town hall. My name is Michael Schlein. I'm the division administrator for the Charities and Legal Services Division uh, at the Secretary of State's office. Today's town hall provides an overview of charitable organizations, registration requirements in Maryland through the lens of a few agencies, us here at the Secretary of State, as well as the Comptroller's Office and the State Department of Assessments and Taxation. Our agencies all have a hand uh, in certain things related to nonprofit organizations, to the charitable organizations, and we're going to talk about those different things today at a high level. And uh, we're delighted uh, to offer the series of town halls as an outreach to educate charities, fundraisers uh, that solicit in Maryland to anyone else that's interested. As indicated in the email notification about today's town hall, the town hall will be recorded and a link to the recording will be available on the Secretary of State's website under the Charities tab. By choosing to join the town hall, you are consenting to the recording. The content and presentation provided is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be legal advice. Uh, in response to emails that we receive from folks, no, this is not a requirement of, of being a charitable organization in Maryland. It says for informational purposes only. And it also bears repeating that, that today's town hall is recorded. Again, the link will be posted on our website. So if we're going through and you miss something, don't worry. Uh, you could ask questions at the end. We'll hold time for that. Uh, but also you can go back and rewatch this town hall or any part of this town hall uh, or if there's information on a slide from this town hall that you wanted to see again that you didn't catch all of, it'll be posted on our website usually within a week or so of this uh, of this town hall is when it'll be posted. Uh, so mentioning questions, hold your questions to the end. Uh, if you hold your questions, you may find that they're answered as the presentation progresses. And if not, you'll have time at the end during your Q&A session. You can also drop some questions in the chat box uh, but I just ask in order to prevent confusion about the source of the response, please don't answer them. Let the Secretary of State or Comptroller or State Department of Assessments and Taxation answer any of those questions. Uh, Well-intentioned folks put some uh, incorrect information in there. So just to prevent that from happening, use that chat box to answer questions, I mean, to ask your questions, but not to answer them uh, for others. Let uh, let us answer those. and. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll take some again at the end and uh, and make sure we try to get as many of them as possible. And as we begin, uh, please mute your microphone. Uh, feel free to keep your cam on if you like. We'd love to see those smiling faces. Uh, with me today is Andres Aviles, Program Manager, Special Functions and Administration from the Comptroller's Office. And also joining us from the State Department of Assessments and Taxation is Jasmine Carter, Deputy Program Manager, Charter Legal, and Maria Mathias, Administrator for Business and uh, Personal Property Franchise Tax, each of whom will address registration requirements of charities with their respective agencies. Uh, so we're going to get started here. And leading us off today will be Jasmine Carter from the State Department of Assessments and Taxation. Jasmine. Good morning. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And we're very excited to be here. Um, as uh, previously stated, I uh, currently I work for the Maryland Department of Assessments and Taxation. Um, within our uh, unit, we have uh, two separate units that are composed of charter legal and the business personal uh, property unit. So um, beginning, I'll start off with talking about charter legal and some of the requirements to form your business in Maryland and exactly what our agency will help you with uh, should you decide to form or maintain your business in Maryland. Uh, so first, you, when you're deciding uh, whether or not you want to form a business in Maryland, um, the first thing you want to do is decide on your business structure. Um, here at our department, we find that some of the most popular entity structures are um, 
limited liability companies, corporations, general partnerships, and sole proprietorships. So on our website, um, you will find a number of forms where you can just insert the relevant in information for forming your company and then submit those documents to our department online or by mail. So you want to do some research and decide on your business structure just to be sure about what type of business you would like to form in Maryland. Typically, if we have uh, entities that are being um, organized or formed for a charitable purpose, you will form a, a tax exempt or a non-stock corporation, but you want to do some of the research on your end first, just to be sure before you submit that document and uh, pay for it through our department. Um, like I said earlier, we have several forms for you that are up on the website. Um, that website is going to be dat.maryland.gov, and I'll also put that in the chat. On that website, at the very top of the page, you'll see several tabs, and you'll want to click on the Forms tab and scroll down the page. And we have a section dedicated to creating or starting a new business in Maryland, and pretty much all of our forms for the formation or creation of an entity in Maryland, we also provide uh, instructions. So you'll be able to review the form instructions. Um, for every business entity in Maryland that's formed, you will be required to have a Maryland resident agent. So that will be an individual who is 18 years of age or older, or a Maryland LLC or corporation that will serve as the resident agent on behalf of the entity. Um, a resident agent is a person or entity that will accept service of process on behalf of that business that you form in case that business is ever sued in Maryland. So it's really important that you decide who that resident agent will be and take some time to have that information readily available. When do you decide to fill out the forms to create your business? Um, if you have any questions, we say get those answered before you submit the document just to cut down on the chance of the document being rejected, we have on that same website an email and also our customer contact center phone number. And you can call our office or you can send a question in uh, by email and we can answer some of those questions that you may have prior to submitting your document to form your business. Um, within uh, the State Department of Assessments and Taxation, <clears throat> excuse me, Charter Legal uh, serves as a repository uh, for business documents in Maryland. So when a business entity forms, amends, or dissolves in Maryland, we make that information public record. Um, so when you're deciding on uh, what type of business you want to form or what information is gonna be included within your business entity documents, you want to take some time and fill those out um, as possible, and also submit documents to our department that are uh, readily, we can readily be able to review and see the information. Um, so as I said before, review your document, make sure um, that we're able to, you know, read what you put on the document. Uh, you want to take some time to write it out clearly or provide a copy of the document that um, is you know, not too dark, uh, doesn't have a lot of marks or things uh, cut out or white out on the document because this will go up for public review. So you just want it to be as neat as possible because it also is a representation of your business should ever anyone go to find your business and go under your file and history. Um, also, when you're deciding to submit a document to the department, if you know that you intend to open a bank account or some other financial um, account in conjunction with that business, you may want to contact your uh, financial a financial representation rep someone who represents that bank, and ask them, um, you know, do do you require a certified copy of my business document? Uh, do I need a certificate of good standing? Uh, sometimes you will find that a financial institution will not allow you to open an account for your business if they do not have those documents. And when you submit your documents to our department, uh, there will be at least um, a period of one week or more 
where your document does not appear available to just review on our website. Uh, so someone will be able to, to see that you form your business, but they won't actually be able to go to that file in history and open up the document to review it because it takes some time for that copy to become available. So you may need to order other documents while submitting your document uh, for final approval. So just contact the bank um, and ask, you know, hey, do you need anything else from me? while I, after I create this business for me to be able to move forward with opening this account. Um, like I said, we have two ways in which you can submit your documents. Um, of, of course, online through our Maryland Business Express portal. Uh, that's the fastest way to submit your documents. You're able to keep up with kind of the progress of your documents. We also give you an estimate as to how long it will take our department to review it. And should there be, be any reason for a rejection of your document, we will send you the rejection by email. And then there is a link that you can click on within that rejection to go back in and edit your filing uh, for that final approval. So um, I, we highly suggest that you submit those documents online. Also, if you decide that you don't want to move forward with um, the formation, you can recall your document so that our department will not approve it. Or if there's a rejection reason and you need to do more research or get more help prior to submitting your document for a final review, um, you're able to leave your document and reject its status and get a refund um, quite fast, usually within about seven to 15 days. Um, so we highly suggest that anyone who is um, thinking about submitting a document to this department, you use that Maryland Business Express portal um, just because it keeps you informed and it's easier to keep up with the status of your document than waiting for the correspondence to arrive by mail. And it cuts down on your need to take out time to call the department or email the, the department because you can kind of see what's going on with everything just in your online portal. Um, like we discussed, you can consider uh, the cost for a certified copy of your document, which will be a copy of the document with the Maryland State seal on it. And then we also provide certificates of status, and that's a certificate that attests to uh, the good standing of your business and also the formation date. Um, file, fastest processing right now online, we offer rush same day filing. Uh, so if you need your business to be created um, in a haste, you're able to submit it for rush review up until 2.30 p.m. that day. If it's submitted after 2.30, we'll review it the very next morning, uh, but you have a couple hours throughout the day to get that document in for same day review. We also offer a regular expedited processing, which typically takes about seven to 10 business days. And finally, we have non-expedited processing online, which generally will take us about four to six weeks. So you have a couple options through the Maryland Business Express when you want to choose on how fast that document gets reviewed. Um, like I said, easy submissions and resubmissions. So let's go into um, what is uh, a non-stock corporation. So if you're intending to form a charitable entity in Maryland, generally the structure that you will choose is generally um, some form of a non-stock corporation. So non-stock corporations do not have the authority to issue stock and they also do not have shareholders. Um, there are generally uh, three non-stock corporations that will be chosen the most, and we have forms for each. So first you have uh, articles of incorporation for a non-stock corporation. We have articles of incorporation for a tax-exempt non-stock corporation. This tax-exempt ent entity does require an additional $50 fee. And that fee gets sent to the Maryland Not-for-Profit Development Center. So in addition to your base filing fee and possibly your expedite fee, um, you'll also have to allocate in an additional $50 for the Maryland Not-for-Profit uh, Development Center fee. We also have articles of incorporation for a religious corporation. And religious corporations are required to be formed to form a congregation or a place of worship. So this must be stated within uh, the purpose of the business. So your non-stock corporation, this corporation is non-stock. It does not have the authority to the issue stock, but it also is not tax exempt. So if you know that uh, you would like to form an entity 
for tax exempt purposes and you may conduct other business in Maryland in which you are required to prove that that corporation um, has a tax exemption, um, you would not want to use that form for just a regular non-stock corporation. You would need to be looking at the form for the tax exempt non-stock corporation. And within that form, the department has already provided language that's acceptable to the IRS, which they can then find in the charter of your company, or you can provide through that certified copy. And the language will um, basically all of the legally accepted language on a federal level um, that, you know, will state that your entity is tax exempt and will um, disperse the profits or dissolve as such will already be there for you. So when you're going through those forms, just make sure you're taking the time to read so that you select the correct one for the purpose of your business. Uh, for your formation requirements of your company, you within the entity name, you are required to have what's called a tail. And a tail in Maryland will be um, the ending or somewhere in your business, uh, something that indicates what type of entity you have formed. So for a corporation, the entity name must uh, include some kind of incorporated or corporated tail. So you will have uh, limited ink, corp, or some abbreviation of those words. Sometimes when people fill out forms for the department, they will just put uh, the name of the company as they wish for it to, to appear, but not have that corporate tail. So when you're filling out that form, just look through the instructions and we provide different ways in which you can include that tail in your business name, but it will need to be included in the entity name unless you're forming a religious corporation in Maryland. But I'll, uh, tax exempt and regular non-stock corporations are required to have a tail. Also, your principal office and uh, resident agent address must be located in Maryland, and you are required to have a physical address. Um, so that cannot be a PO box or shipping address. If you live in a really small town or you'll be conducting business within a small town and the address may appear to be a PO box or a shipping address, um, you can reach out to the department in advance before you submit your document and let us know uh, the entity name. And we can um, hold your document once you submit it for review um, to check the address just to make sure that it does not get rejected there are times when people are in small municipalities and their address will appear to be some kind of like UPS or shipping center, but it actually is not. So if that may be the case for your business, again, just reach out to our department and we'll make the adjustments necessary so that we don't have to reject your document. If you are forming a business and you do not want like your home associated um, or any other address that may be associated with somewhere uh, that you personally may live, um, you can also use the services of different um, businesses in Maryland, which will allow you to use their co-working space to have a principal office or resident agent address that does not um, have any association with your home or any other location that you would like to keep private. Uh, but those places like UPS, uh, FedEx, parcel shipping centers, they are not acceptable and they will um, result in multiple rejections if you continue to put them in your document. And finally, once we approve uh, your formation document, you will be giving a unique department identification number in Maryland. For corporations, that number will begin with a D or F depending on whether you are a Maryland uh, entity that was formed in Maryland or a non-Maryland entity that was formed in another state. But we provide that department identification number so that you are able to prove in Maryland that you have the right to legally operate your business within this state. So um, here at the department, each year we have new uh, legislative initiatives to help uh, business owners within Maryland, and sometimes uh, those regulatory or legislative initiatives are drafted um, or suggested by members of this department. Um, so first we have um, for non-stock corporations, there has been a requirement in Maryland that was long standing that when any entity is dissolved, um, 
forfeited in Maryland, you are required to file annual reports. And these reports are uh, required to be filed by a business entity each year reporting on um, if there is any personal property or other uh, financial co conduct in Maryland that relates to how that business operates. So if a business has been forfeited, the department has always required the annual report from the time of forfeiture up into the most recent annual report that was due. Uh, just recently, non-stock corporations are now not required to file all annual reports from the time of forfeiture if the non-stock corporation will revive online. So that will require the entity to file the most recently due seven annual reports and articles of revival online. So even if the uh, non-stock corporation was forfeited by the department in 1984, um, that entity would not be required to file all of the annual reports from the 80s up until now. The company could online just file the most recently due seven annual reports plus the articles of revival. Um, if you are associated with an entity that is attempting to revive online that is uh, non-stock or religious and you're having issues with following, uh, following just the most recently due annual reports, you can contact our office. And if for some reason the system will not accommodate those reports, uh, myself or another deputy will work with you um, so that you're able to only file those reports in the articles of revival. But generally, there aren't any issues and you would be able to revive online. But if uh, you do run into any issues, you can contact us and we'll make it happen for you. Um, same day processing is now available for non-stock corporations online. So that means you can submit those articles of incorporation on a rush basis online. And we will review that document within two hours of the submission. Uh, previously, that filing type was not available online for rush processing, uh, but it is now. So like I said earlier, if you need that document to be submitted um, on a rush basis and you need an approval um, same day, you can submit your document up until 2.30 p.m. that day, and our office will review the document. And of course, is there if there's anything that needs to be corrected, it comes to you by email uh, very quickly. So you're able to jump back into your account and correct the document and then resubmit it. Articles of dissolution in Maryland um, now ha have the ability to provide the department with what's called a future effective date. So generally, articles of dissolution are effective upon approval, but if you want that document to have a later effective date, you are now able to give the department an effective date up to 30 days in advance, which uh, previously was not an option for corporations that wanted to dissolve in Maryland. And then finally, we have it an affidavit now that's called uh, an outdated or improper address affidavit. And the department noticed that we had a number of business owners who were contacting our office, especially uh, during um, the height of COVID. And these business um, owners or these homeowners were alleging that there were other businesses that were being associated with their home address uh, that did not have the authority to use their home address and were in, in no way connected to their home. So now the property owners of uh, these and homes can reach out to the department, complete an affidavit, and they can state the allegations in the affidavit that there is some business that has been using their um, address for a principal office, resident agent, or mailing location. And they can let us know um, that this is improper and that that business owner does not have the ability to use or the permission to use their address. And if we find that those allegations um, are supported and substantial, our office will void the filing that was used to create that entity. And the business will eventually go not in good standing and later may be forfeited by the state of Maryland. Uh, so some of those are just some of the most recently um, recent changes in Maryland. Uh, but if you have any questions, just put them in the chat or stay later and we'll be happy to answer them.
All right, and now uh, my colleague Maria will be uh, starting her presentation. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to thank you, Jasmine. That was very informative. I just wanted to let you know that after you formed and you've been accepted, um, there is the tax property article 11-101 that, that covers a requirement now to file a form one with SDAT, which is usually an annual report and business personal property return. We now have something new for 2022 and usually from the 2023, um, we actually have this on the annual report now that allows an exemption for a low assessment based on ownership of property that is less than 20,000. Um, this particular um, exemption is kind of fluid because things could change. You could have you know, maybe a banner year, get in, get started in something else. And um, what you'll want to do is, is be exempt for a charitable or educational um, operation. This 7245 exemption is available to all entities that have less than 20,000 um, of furniture, fixtures, tools, machinery, equipment, um, and inventory in Maryland, okay? So um, again, this is 7245, uh, the tax property article of the Code of Maryland, okay? You can go to the next one, okay. I'm also joined today also by uh, Martin Barnes, who is um, program manager for business personal property. And he also has under um, his, um, management is the audit team. So while there was never really um, an exemption for this class of property under fi any 501, what the department decided to do was have an exemption for charitable or edu educational operations. And that was under the tax property article 7-202, charitable or educational purposes. Because not everything, you know, you could have someone, let's say, have um, um, a reunion foundation or something else, and they wouldn't necessarily be exempt from business personal property tax. Okay, this particular this particular article grants an exemption from personal property assessments um, for the assets that are owned by any of the um, entities that we considered charitable or educational by SDAT. It's done by application. The applications can be found on our website. We also have the link in this um, particular um, presentation. We usually get about five, 50 to 60 applications each year. There were, our biggest um, uptick was in 2020 when we had in closer to 100. So in 2021, we had just slightly under 70 applications. In 2022, same thing. And so far this year, we have about 25. Okay, here you can find um, information on the business personal property exemption applications on these websites, these links. Um, we allow you to uh, submit your applications by email to the audit team or and by telephone we're available if you have any questions um the decisions on the exemption for uh assess uh, the exemption from assessment are done in the year or any time after the first filing requirement of the form one is we don't do it in advance you can't say oh i'm thinking about doing this i'd like to do this again you know we don't really give that advice but there's nothing for us to look at because your exemption under 7202 if should you need that for something else is on the property that is owned by the organization and you must be in good standing to be granted this exemption if you are forfeited and right now we are in our forfeiture season if um your right to do business has been revoked for some reason or your charter has been forfeited for failure on on some level um you must reapply. And we generally do a 10% um, 
check on all of these uh, all of these entities that may have been granted a 7202 exemption in the prior year per um, the Office of Legislative Audits instructions. Um, uh, here's that link. And then the next pages are also the exemptions, the applications. So this is what they look like um, and they're, you know, fillable. We also have included this year the exemption applications, the charitable exemption applications for real property because, um, you know, there's an exemption for that as well. All of their contact information is listed. Um, I'll give you just a, a little example. Um, I think at one point we had um, a property that was owned and was exempt. They had a charitable uh, function, but they also were renting out their facilities, you know, um, for let's say wedding receptions or other parties. So we, we did um, a percentage. So if you did maybe 30% of your business was for um, a non-charitable function, then we would assess 30% of your property. This is your business personal property. And I think that that is it really for us. I don't, unless Martin has anything that he'd like to add. Um, I will say that, you know, there were, what, historically what we would do was take, you know, the non-stocks. Those were the ones that we would be looking at. But nowadays you have, um, let's say some LLCs that are medical practices that might be located say at university and they are getting the educational exemption because they're at that teaching hospital and there are times that they're using that property that may not necessarily be owned by the hospital for their educational um, operations, their teaching as well. Martin, do you have anything you'd like to add? I know he was on, maybe not. Okay. Um, oh, hey. no. oh. Yeah, oh, there you are. Sorry. Yeah, I couldn't f find my mic. <laughs> <laughs> now I think you got everything. Just with the application, just make sure you give us a clear description of what type of operation you're doing. Like what, if it's education or if it's charity, charitable. Some some companies will put just like a one line thing but we need a like a detailed description of exactly what the corporation is doing in maryland yeah and we'll i know that typically when back and forth yeah um sometimes you know we some additional questions we may ask is whether or not um you have um let's say a a, a charity um, policy? Is there something that you, if you have a, a an assisted living or something like that, do you offer um, reduced rates or, you know, what percentage of, um, you know, poverty uh, people will you accept? Things like that. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, Jasmine, Maria, Martin, appreciate it. Uh, great information. Uh, I'm going to go now. Uh, Secretary of State's office again. I'm Michael Schlein. And um, we're going to talk about charitable solicitation registration. Uh, so if you're a Maryland organization, you've uh, you form your non-stock tax exempt corporation or uh, whatever corporation it is you filed, and you're going to solicit charitable contributions in the state of Maryland, there's a registration requirement with us at the Secretary of State's office. Uh, and indeed, the organization needs to file prior to conducting charitable solicitations in Maryland. So what we're going to talk about uh, here for the Solicitations Act in the Secretary of State's office uh, is found in uh, the Business Regulation Article Title VI and uh, uh, Code of Maryland Regulations 010204. So first thing we want to establish is, do you have to register? And a charitable organization shall register and receive a registration letter from the Secretary of State before the organization, one, solicits contributions in Maryland, or two, has contributions solicited on its behalf in Maryland, 
or three, solicits charitable contributions outside of Maryland if the organization is located in Maryland. So any one of these things uh, would, would drive a requirement to register for an organization that's soliciting charitable contributions. And there, kind of in bold in, the, in, in italics there at the bottom, it talks about uh, if you're located in Maryland and you have a donate button on your website or you do any soliciting on other social media, that is considered soliciting charitable contributions in Maryland. So if you're domiciled in Maryland and you solicit for a charitable purpose, even if it's just online through website or social media, that does trigger the registration requirement because you're located in Maryland and soliciting anywhere. So what's a charitable contribution? Uh, something that's made on the representation will be used for a charitable purpose. Uh, charitable contributions include uh, payment, transfer, enforceable pledge of financial help. It includes money, credit, property, or services. Generally speaking, a charitable contribution does not include an unsolicited gift, does not include a government grant or government money, membership assessments, dues or fines, or payments for property sold or services rendered or a public safety contribution as defined in the Solicitations Act. Uh, what we're usually seeing here in organizations that submit documentation, uh, you see a lot of um, government grants, government money uh, that does not count towards contributions, and you see uh, membership dues or pay payment for services provided uh, that are not contributions. Uh, What's a charitable solicitation? This is also a very important question that um, kind of understanding this, this definition will help <clears throat> understand why we count some of the things we do as charitable contributions and why they count towards a threshold and why you have to register if you're doing these. So in general, a charitable solicitation is an oral writ request <clears throat> for a charitable contribution, regardless of whether the person making the request receives the charitable contribution. So the key here is that a, an entity organization asks for the charitable contribution. <clears throat> Excuse me. It does not matter if that contribution is actually given uh, to the organization. It's the fact that it was asked for. That That's what makes it a charitable solicitation. So there's a lot of stuff underneath of what charitable solicitation includes, but I'm really going to hone in on that last bullet point and the sub bullet points uh, sale of or offer or attempt to sell an admission, advertisement, uh, book, car, chance, coupon, device, membership, merchandise, subscription, ticket, other tangible item, in connection with which an appeal is made for charitable contributions. The name of the charitable organization is used expressly or implicitly to induce a purchase, or a statement is made that some or all the proceeds from the sale are to be used for a charitable purpose. Um, again, there's other there's other points there, uh, but really what the key in all this is, is, that, is if you're using the organization's name in conjunction with selling, let's say, a ticket, like a raffle ticket, or if you're having a fundraising event and you're trying to get people to come, say you're having, we're in Maryland, so we're just going to say your organization's hosting a crab feast and the money's going to be you know, the revenue generated is going to assist the organization in furthering its purpose. That's it's a fundraising event. You're using the organization's name to drive attendance, right? And somewhere in there is always something that expressly or implicitly is asking for the, right? You're trying to get people to buy the ticket to come to your event to help your charitable organization. So those revenue of uh, uh, fundraising events, um, they are charitable solicitations and the revenue generated from them for the purpose of the Maryland Solicitations Act and the registration requirements counts towards the thresholds for uh, charitable contributions. So fundraising revenue from these events counts as a contribution under the act, which counts towards all those filing thresholds, the 25,000 or less, if you, are, if you don't need to do the full registration or uh, also towards registration fee requirements or audit or review calculations, revenue from those fundraising events counts because that is one way of soliciting charitable contributions and not to be confused with what the IRS considers a donation. 
versus what the Maryland Solicitations Act considers a charitable contribution for the purpose of the registration requirements under the act. So two different definitions, two different things. So fundraising events, they count uh, as a charitable solicitation and the revenue generated from them, the gross revenue, not the net, the gross revenue from them counts towards the charitable contributions thresholds for the purposes of the various registration requirements. A few other slides here before we talk about what it is you're gonna give us to register. Uh, we have online filing now as of August 15th, 2022, you can file online. If you've already submitted a paper application, don't submit another application online. We're gonna process that paper app if we already have it. Uh, communications, including renewal reminders and compliance letters that will now come from the new registration system. They're sent to you via email. So very important that your contact information is up to date. It was always important that it's up to date, uh, whether we were mailing you a letter or sending you an email. If we get something and it's incomplete, we're gonna reach out and try to get it completed so that the organization can complete its registration, whether that's an initial or an annual registration. So very important that we have that proper contact information. Uh, if you've already registered, don't try to go submit a new application uh, on, on one stop. Uh, there's a record claiming process where you can kind of uh, set up your account and then get access to the organization's profile and, uh, and file your annual registrations through your organization's profile uh, in one stop. And um, there's a lot of information on the charity page, sos.maryland.gov. If you go there to the Secretary of State's homepage, you click on charities. Uh, the very first things are the different user guides and video guides for setting up an account, claiming record, filing new or annual registrations in the system. Uh, it's all right there for you. If you have any trouble, uh, check those out. They're very helpful. They walk you through step by step. And even the user guides, they tell you step by step, but they even have pictures of, of what you're looking at and for as you go through the process of claiming a record or filing online or just updating your contact information uh, through the organization's website. And one of the, the important piece there too about uh, account creation on one stop is the, the email address of record is the one that's tied to, uh, to the organization. So, you know, say I, I if, if my organization's email is abc at gmail.com, and I try to create a one-stop account with a different email, the system's not gonna know that I am abc at gmail.com unless I create my account as such, and it'll know, okay, this is that person who has access to uh, this record. So make sure you're creating your one-stop account with the email address of record so you can claim uh, that, that record and start filing online. The organization owes part of an annual registration from a prior year, we may request it be sent outside of the system generally that's happening because we don't we don't want you to double pay uh if you double pay uh we're going to refund it but why double pay if you don't have to right um why why go through the process of refund uh if, if we can get the stuff offline and get the organization current so we talked a little bit about um user guides and creating a one-stop account already um, so just kind of really walked you through this slide on the last slide, uh, but I'll keep it up here for a second. Use those video guides, use the user guides on our charity page. There's the direct link to our charity page. But if you remember nothing else from this link, SOS, like Secretary of State, .maryland.gov, click on charities, and you'll get to this information and all sorts of other information about solicitation registration and some other helpful resources for charitable organizations. Uh, on this page. <clears throat> Just a few tips and thoughts for using OneStop. Um, you're allowed to authorize access to other individuals. So say you're the treasurer and you're the email address of record. Once you claim your record, you can actually invite other people from your board to have access to the organization's profile on OneStop uh, so that more than one person can access it. Uh, you know, boards change over time. So maybe I leave and somebody else comes in, but right, or I leave and that spot's vacant for a while. If you got more than one board member on that organization's profile on one stop, more than one person could sign in, more than one person could file. It theoretically helps you there uh, prevent 
uh, falling behind on annual registrations. The other, the other thought on this too is the form is really built to ask for what's required. Based on your answers to the questions, a lot of folks will look at the form, they'll just scroll from front to back and they'll see things that don't, don't look normal to them and they'll get concerned. And uh, that's because the form is going to, based on your answers to the first few questions, is gonna kind of morph into what you actually need. Um, so make sure you're answering those first few questions correctly. And they generally deal with, you know, what did you file last year with the IRS? Did you file a 990, 990EZ, 990PF, 990N, none of the above. And depending on that, it's going to ask you for certain information from your form, from your 990. And then it's going to ask if you're applying for an exemption. Uh, by exemption, we're talking about, uh, exemption from solicitation registration, not are you exempt from federal income tax? Uh, again, keeping those terms and what we're looking and doing here separately. Uh, if you're filing with us, you're doing it under the Solicitations Act. Um, although some of those terms sound similar, the definitions aren't always the same. And if you're under $25,000 a year in contributions, uh, the, the form is gonna take you down the path of the exempt organization fundraising notice form rather than a new or a annual registration. So it's gonna take you down this exempt filer path uh, because it knows you're under $25,000 a year and you don't use a professional solicitor. For organizations that have a religious exemption, uh, you'll continue to submit your 990 annually, uh, but you don't have to file a annual registration in the system. You can just drop us that 990 via email like you already do. Same for name changes. Uh, you'll need to submit name change documentation you'll submit that outside the system to us via email as well. Uh, but otherwise, your annual registrations, your annual exempt organization fundraising notice forms, you can do in the online system. If you're submitting multiple annual registrations because you owe multiple years worth of filings and you owe a late fee, only pay the late fee associated with one of those filings. Uh, the system is calculating late, fee date, late fees based on the date that you were last due. And um, so if, if you're submitting a bunch at one time, it may try to hit you a couple times for those late fees, pay one, ask for a waiver on the other ones on the basis that you're already paying the late fee from your, you know, one of those filings that is late. And the other aspect uh, that I think folks should pay attention to, it's there really to be a good tool for you at the top of the form, when you create a new online annual registration form, it tells you what we think your renewal date is at the top of the form. Look at that date. If that date seems incorrect, if you think you're current and it says you're not only current through last year, so you're not current, reach out to us and let us know. Um, maybe you sent us something and we haven't processed it yet. Maybe you sent us something and we just don't have it for whatever reason um don't just kind of file and assume and pay and then ask it check in with us before you submit that application uh, we want to help you file the right thing the first time if we can and get you the right information and you know maybe maybe uh the date is wrong and maybe it's because we had an administrative error on our side that you know that happens right we have people reviewing and processing these applications and people uh people can make those mistakes right uh, i think everybody here is made a mistake in life and that happens to the best of us so maybe maybe your organization is late maybe it's some kind of administrative error that needs to be cleaned up and we'd rather do that before you file and uh have the system ask you to pay a leaf fee that maybe you didn't really owe or maybe you didn't know you owe it and you're just trying to figure out what it is you need before you file and that's great too right if you're unsure reach out in advance um the only other warning uh, I should add to this slide, I, I, I mentioned it because I've talked to a few folks about it just within the last week or two. Uh, a lot of organizations are filing online out for the second time in the system. And what they did when they initially filed is they created several forms and they're just going back and picking up an old draft. But that old draft still thinks you're not current because you submitted it at, or you started at a time where you were, you know, current through 2022 instead of 2023 or something like that. So uh if you're filing an annual registration start a new form and fill it out don't pick up an old form from last year because that old form may have some old information on it uh if, if you have old forms in your queue if you have a bunch of drafts 
that you're not using, you can open that draft and scroll to the bottom and just hit the discard button and throw it out, right? Keep your keep your system clean. Uh, don't start a bunch of stuff you don't need to file. If you have a bunch of drafts hanging out, open it, scroll to the bottom, hit discard, get rid of it. So you don't try to file a form uh, that thinks you're not current if you are. Best laid plans on new systems, right? You try to find ways to catch things and help everybody. Uh, sometimes you create other issues in there. So uh, work through that system. And if you have questions, let us know. So what are you actually filing with us? Uh, whether, uh, whether it was something you sent us online or on paper, uh, registration statements, articles of incorporate, copy of the articles of incorporation or other governing instruments. So it could be bylaws, organizational charter, one of those items. Something that confirms tax exempt status. So your IRS tax determination letter is usually what we're getting in that situation. Uh, there are times where it's something other than the IRS letter, um, usually explaining that the organization's a 501c3, but it may be something different. Copies of 990, last, last fiscal year that's been completed. If you don't have 990s, it's gonna ask you to fill out a COF 85, which is a state form that you fill out. If uh, the state filing requirement, the full registration starts at 25,000, but your IRS filing requirement, the 990N starts at, let's say about 50,000 a year. Right? So you got that kind of gap between 25 and 50 where you're not filing a 990EZ or 990, but you have to do the full registration. And that's the vast majority of folks that do CLF 85s are in that, in that range. Again, there are some exceptions to that, but uh, if you're not filing a 990, 990EZ or 990PF, and you're over 25,000 a year in contributions, you're gonna fill out that CLF 85. Uh, you're also going to provide us your current board of directors list uh organizations yeah we're aware the 990 has your board list on it but that's your board list from the prior fiscal year that may not be the same as your current board of directors we want your current board list when you're filing your annual registrations not last year's board list that's already on your 990. Um, you may be required to file some additional items for a new uh, registration and those are financial reviewer audits. Uh, and you see there's thresholds at uh, 300,000 to 750,000 in charitable contributions, you need a review. 750,000 in contributions or more, you need an audit. Uh, if you have fundraising contracts with uh, fundraising council and professional solicitors, you send copies of those. Uh, if you're affiliated with a state agency, you disclose that. If you're over 750,000, there's an extra item needed. And, Registration fee. If you're under twenty-five thousand a year, you're not paying a registration fee. Uh, those registration fees are range from fifty to three hundred dollars. The only time you're under twenty-five thousand, you may pay a registration fee, is if you use a professional solicitor. Annually, looks very very similar to what we just saw on the last page. Instead of the initial registration, you're filing your annual registration form. You're filing a nine ninety. If you don't have one, you're following a COF 85, you're giving us your updated board list. If you change your articles or your bylaws, you're gonna submit your uh, amended articles or bylaws. This annual registration is due 10 and a half months after the organization's fiscal year ends. So if you have a fiscal year that ends December 31st, you need to file this stuff by November 15th. So we have a major filing deadline coming up very soon for all the calendar year uh, filers, folks that have a fiscal year that runs January 1 through December 31st. If you're a fiscal year that ends June 30th, you're uh, going to file May 15th of that following year. So 10 and a half months from your fiscal year's end, that's when your due date is. Same things as on the prior slide, reviews and audits uh, at certain thresholds. If you have contracts with councils or solicitors, you send them in. Same with disclosing affiliation with state agency. Same rule on the registration fees annually, fifty to three hundred dollars. If you're under twenty-five thousand, but you have a professional solicitor, you're still going to pay a fee. If you're under twenty-five thousand, you're not going to pay a fee if you don't have a professional solicitor. And that's what we're going to talk about here. The exempt organization fundraising notice is the form you're going to provide us. Uh, if you have a nine ninety or nine ninety EZ, uh, you're going to give us a copy of it. If you don't, that's okay. Uh, you're going to answer uh, the questions we need. And uh, if you file a 990N, we're not going to ask for a copy of it. We're just going to ask for certain information on this form. You're going to provide that, and that's okay. Uh, IRS tax determination letter, if applicable, 
there's a question on the form uh, would ask if the organization is a 501c3, if it's been granted 501c3 status by the IRS. If the answer is no, it's okay. Check no. Um, if it's pending, which means you've submitted an application to the IRS to get 501c3 and haven't heard anything yet, click pending. You have C3, check yes. Uh, it's not a true question. Whatever the answer is, just answer it accurately. Uh, but this is what you're going to file with us if you're under 25000 a year in charitable contributions. Whoops, Whoops. there we go. Uh, get back to that real quick for one more second. Um, you know, in short, uh, the online filing form generally provides a better quality of filing because it's not going to let you submit something if it's not complete. We get a lot of paper forms over the years and they're missing information. And uh, the online form is going to not let you submit it if you leave something blank that's required. And um, so it also helps guide you down the path of what you actually need. Uh, we a lot of folks that sometimes file more than they need to file. You don't need to do that or they pay fees when they don't owe a fee. Don't pay us a fee if you don't know a fee, and the online system will help in that. And if there's a problem, if you file an online form and you attach the wrong thing in the wrong in the wrong field or whatever, and we need to send it back, we'll send it back through the system. You'll get a notice of that being sent back to you. You pop in the system, you pull it back up, and you fix whatever it is, and you resubmit it. And uh, that can be done a lot quicker uh, than the old-fashioned send you something in the mail, and uh, and you get it whenever you get it. Uh, you see it later. Um, so be on the lookout for those emails. And if everything's good on your online filing and we review it and accept it, you're going to get the email that says, hey, you're now current through next year, whatever it is uh, that you're current through. So uh, make sure we are, uh, you know, filing, fill out the form. If you're unsure of something, ask us up front, you know, check in with us if you're unsure. Uh, a lot easier and a lot better if we get it right the first time. But if we don't, that's okay. We'll send it back to you. You'll update it and then resubmit it. And then we'll get it approved. So annual registration requirements under the Solicitations Act at the Maryland Secretary of State's office is uh, what I just covered. And now we're going to turn turn it over to uh, Andres Aviles of the uh, Comptroller's office. Andres. Thank you, Michael, and um, thank you for, for this opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> that's a lot of information there. Um, hopefully, you know, you guys um, get some those information uh, in put it in a good use, uh, but there's more. There's more here information to share. <laughs> um, so after you have, you know, visited the the, um, the State Department of Asset Assessment and Taxation uh, and reg registered your business, and then you pay the visit to uh, um, to the Secretary of State uh, for those donations that you're about to collect and all of that. Then pay us a visit at the Comptroller's office um, for the sales and use tax exemption certificate if you want to get um, an exemption. Um, I'm sure as a nonprofit organization, you want to, um, you know, uh, purchase the, those items that you need to operate your business. And those items, so, you know, you have to pay a 6% sales tax. Uh, as a nonprofit organization, you will, will be conducting those business and you need a break, right? After paying all those fees, so you need a break. Uh, and here is the break. So you apply for the sales and use tax exemption uh, so that you can obtain a certificate um, so that you will be able not to pay uh, sales tax uh, or those items that you need to operate your business. So let's get to it. So the Comptroller's Office uh, issue issues a sales and use tax essential certificate to certain qualifying non-profit organizations, entitle them to, um, you know, to make the specific purchases without paying the sales tax, as I mentioned before. Uh, those organizations may qualify for this exemption, and those are, generally speaking, non-profit, charitable, educational, and religious organizations. Those, um, there are uh, volunteer fire companies and rescue squads, uh, non-profit cemeteries companies, uh, qualifying veterans organizations, government agencies, and credit unions. Now, um, we are currently continuing renewing uh, sales and use tax essential certificate that uh, those they currently hold the September 30th, 2022 certificate that expired last year. 
Um, we the renewal process they started uh, in May in 2022. We, those who are already renewed and those who came after September 2027, I mean September 2022, they are continuing renewing now and we are still continuing renewing those um, until we get all the population renewed so if you if it happens if you if you has a sales and use tax essential certificate that is september that expired already uh september 30th 2022 please visit our website and there is a link for the renewal certificate uh click on that link at the marylandtaxes.gov uh, on the tab, uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, you can click on that tab, and there is a several accordions there. Look for the renewal, um, um, renewal certificate, <clears throat> and they direct you there to the link so that you can renew your certificate. Now, if you are holding a certificate that is prior to September, um, September 2022 from last year, let's say that your certificate expire in September 2017 or prior to that you must apply for a brand new certificate. So you have to submit a brand new application like you never did before. Uh, and that is because we have to conduct an audit and, and to make sure that your organization is up to date. So let's go to the next slide so I can explain a little bit better about that. <clears throat> By law, Maryland can only issue a such a certificate to qualify nonprofit organization that is located in Maryland. Now, there are some um, states that can apply uh, for the sales and use tax essential certificates, and those are states that are adjacent jurisdictions, and those are Delaware, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, and Washington, D.C. Um, those certificates uh, can be issued to those nonprofit organizations, um, and usually they are printed on a white paper. Um, with green ink and contained a expiration date of September 20, I mean, September 30th, 2027. And for those certificates that are issued to governmental entity are generally printed on a white paper with red ink and contain no expiration date. Um, we don't have much of those. Uh, we generally has those regular nonprofit organization uh, that with the green with the green the white paper with the green ink so those are the most popular so let's go to the next slide yeah. so as i mentioned before the uh, non-profit organization may use this essential certificate to purchase tangible personal property and they can be uh, used in carrying on his its work uh, this include any office supplies or equipment on any other items or materials they need to carry their own work um, these essential certificates is, the, is a wallet size card and it bears the eight digit um, exception number and it has an expiration date. In this case, it's September um, 30th, 2027. It's just a five year um, certificate. So every five years, you have to renew that certificate. This certificate is not transferable and it must be used by the holder of this certificate or the, in this case, the registered organization. So how can you apply for this certificate? The next slide, we're going to show you the way to apply. Currently, um, you can apply for, uh, for the certificate via paper. You can obtain the application, the sales and use tax essential certificate application, uh, the Maryland's, um, it's a Maryland Sutec application, but you can vi visit our website, uh, marylandsutec.gov. I mean, I'm sorry, marylandtaxes.gov. And there you can download this application, fill it out and attach the required documents. Um, Later on, I'm going to um, go in detail what those uh, required doc documents are. Or you can call our Taxpayer Services Division. Um, they can provide that document, that application be sent to you via email. Or you can request that um, via email, the application to be sent to you. We gladly can send that to you. Um, at the SUTEC uh, at MarylandTaxit.gov, you send that request. We'll be glad to send that to you as well. Once you complete this application and attach the required document, you can mail the application and the documents to that address shown there, uh, the Central Registration SUTEC unit. Uh, the next slide, we have a, an exciting news that we want to share. Um, 
the SUTEC application is going to be on an online application. We are implementing an online application for first time applicant. So we're planning to roll this out the first quarter of 2024. We're gonna be announcing this at the first quarter and we're gonna be showing that on our website and we're gonna guide all the nonprofit how to apply. But the website will look like this and it's a Maryland Tax Connect and there is a quick link. At the bottom of that quick link, the fifth, I believe, if I can see from the screen here, um, it has a link, it says Maryland Sales and Use Tax Exemption Certificate Application. By clicking that link, it will direct you to uh, this application and you can fill it out very easy, one, two, three steps. And once you do that, you will be able to upload all the required documents uh, in a PDF format, preferably PDF format. You also support other type of formats, as a Word doc or um, I think it's a TILF uh, also. And there's all the capability to upload, but we prefer um, the document be uploaded in a PDF format. This is exciting. And once we get this rolled out, there's a few things that we are ironing on this website. But by the first quarter of 2024, we'll be posting this and advising um, all our nonprofit out there um, to apply it online instead of submitting it via paper. That would cut the process in time. This is exciting. Currently, we have the six. Uh, four to six week process in time. Once we roll out um, the online application, we uh, hope that we cut the process in time by half. And hopefully once we roll this out by mid of the year, it could be even half of that time. So instead of waiting for your certificates uh, four to six week, it could be in between two to three weeks. That's a lot faster. So um, looking forward to that. So next slide. Um, we're going to go into a little detail on the SUTEC application. Uh, and the SUTEC application is in three parts. It's only one page long, but um, we divide it on three parts. The first part is the demographic inf information. Uh, we want to, uh, on this part, uh, the federal ID number of the applicant, um, the full legal name of the corporation, and the physical address and the mailing address. And um, I like to emphasize that on the um, physical address, we want the actual physical address of the nonprofit organization. A PO box cannot be on this line. If your mailing address is a PO box, then it's okay. The next slide is the, what we call it uh, the authorized officer part line. We require two authorized officers. And normally, um, uh, authorized officer is the person that is formally empowered by the business entity to conduct the business on its behalf or a person who can act on, on, on an official capacity. That could be an, a CEO or CFO or a president, secretary, treasurer, or anybody who has that capacity. Um, usually the article incorporation or the bylaws identify that person. So the person needs to be stated on these two lines. We require two and full name, address, title, phone number, all the information that we require, including the social security number. The next slide, we're gonna go, um, finish it up with the third part, which is the signature line and um, some additional information. Uh, on the top of the of that form, we'll require a brief information of the nonprofit. What is the, the their vision, the mission? Uh, usually the bylaws uh, talks about their mission um, of the nonprofit, you can state it there, or you can briefly state um, what's the vision of the nonprofit. That helps us to understand what's the purpose of your uh, nonprofit. Um, line seven, as you see there, you must state whether you um, have a, um, an IRS in, um, determination letter under the Internal Revenue Code 501c3 or any other. If you do, you check the box yes if you do not indicate what section you are uh, exempt under and identify that section on the uh, blank space that help us to determine um, on that on a specific section that you state um, that will help us to uh, look into that section and see if you qualified under that section and then you, you obviously uh, the authorized officer stated online on the previous line 5a or 5b must sign the application title signature and the date now 
if this application is being fi um, filed and signed by a, a representative of the organization, then a power of attorney needs to be attached to it. Um, we have a power of attorney, the form is 548, and we have been using this form since uh, 2017, and we require that the form 548 needs to be attached. No other power of attorney is accepted. It has to be form 548. This form can be found on our website, um, MarylandTaxes.gov. Yeah, you can um, search that on our search tool, uh, on our search engine. Uh, just type form 548, and that form is fillable. You can fill it out and have the represent the the nonprofit to sign it and have you sign it, indicate um, the capacity that you're in, and you can attach that form in there and check that box that you are attaching the power attorney. Once we process the power attorney along with the form and the attached document, we can process your application. Now, in the next slide, I think it talks about the generally required documents. These are the documents um, that you must attach to this application, uh, whether via paper, when you submit the application, or when we roll out this application online. Uh, copy of your revenue service determination letter. 501 C3, C4, C19, or any other that you think that you qualified under. A copy of the organization's article of incorporation or any other organizing document. A copy of the organization bylaws. If the bylaws has a signature line for any reason, you must, that line needs to, if it is a signature line, must be signed and dated. If it is non uh, blank, is fine. Um, for those organizations that are located in Maryland, we would like to have a copy of the letter of good standing from the Maryland Department of Assessment and Taxation. Uh, and that's come to the first part what Jasmine and Jasmine's team were talking about. Once you register with the Department of Assessment and Taxation and you're in good standing, you submit, you, that's part of the, the document that you need to submit um, attached to this application. Um, some, um, Nonprofit organization, what I've seen in, on the application is they print out uh, online the the good standing from the website. That is acceptable, totally acceptable. You don't have to have an actual letter. Uh, you can print out from the website. We accept those as well. Uh, if your nonprofit organization is located in any of those adjacent jurisdictions, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Virginia, or any of those that I mentioned, um, then we require a, a letter or a certificate of good standing of that state. Um, and any other documentation uh, that is specified on the form instructions or, or the SUTEC application instructions. And that is generally for religious organization. Um, those religious organization, uh, they have a location in Maryland, they must have a rental agreement if they are not own, if they own the property, we want to know the, the deed or the property, uh, the document that they, they shows the property of um, the ownership of the property. Uh, or if they are renting a space, we want to see that. Um, if they are operating the church out of their home, um, there are some counties they allow that. We want to know the permission of the county and all those details. Uh, there is more specific um, information on that on the instructions. But if Anything, if there is any question related to that, uh, just please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you can call taxpayer services, um, at the phone number that's displayed on this application, or you can reach out to um, to us at SUTEC at MarylandTaxes.gov, I mean, SUTEC at um, MarylandTaxes.gov. So once you reach out to us, we can answer just question, uh, your questions. And I think that's um, short and sweet and not much to it. <laughs> so um, that's it. I will turn the floor to you, Michael. Thanks, Andres. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, thanks again, uh, Jasmine, Maria, Martin, Andres, uh, State Department of Assessments and Taxation, and uh, Maryland Comptroller. Uh, just uh, just a refresher here before we uh, field some questions. Uh, you did information here is it's for informational purposes only it's not intended to be legal advice and just a reminder that the recording will be available uh, on our website usually within a week or so of the town hall 
and um, so it should be there soon. Uh, we'll post this, and uh, hopefully this was very informative. Uh, we'll continue holding our town halls, and I think our next one on charity matters is donor education, just kind of the general donor awareness, holiday giving uh, type of town hall. Uh, so we appreciate you joining us today. And uh, anybody 